tonight what you're going to hear is um, Donald George is going to be interviewing two people that are that are uh, that are very very uh, wonderful writers. Jason has returned to Book Passage after years and an extraordinary uh, extraordinary life event and an amazing book. So uh, Jason was a was actually one of the small fry like me, like so many of the other participants at one time, and now he's this amazing writer. He he was here close to the beginning. I think uh, went to the Writers Center for a little while, and um, and really learned so much at the conference. But then went on to become a wonderful writer. And um, I think that this is our village, and this is where we get the tools to go out into the world and be able to do what we end up doing as, as journalists. Um, so Don is going to be introducing him. His book, The Way of Wanderlust, is here. Yegi is also on the, on the panel, Jason's wife. She was a prisoner in um, a prison in Iran for 72 days. And I just heard her speak about her committee to protect journalists. It's, it's, an, incredible, um, it's an incredible organization, and she's doing a lot. I can't wait to hear what she has to say. And then um, Jason will be talking about um, his 544-day um, ordeal as a prisoner in, um, in an Iranian prison, not knowing what was going with, on with um, Yegi for part of the time. It's a beautiful book. It's romantic. It's um, a book of strength and love, a story about place, and the deepest, darkest corners of person. And um, I, I just, I'm just so honored to be able to introduce them. It's going to be a lovely night. Donald, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, very much for the wonderful introduction. Thank you all so much for coming here tonight. It's wonderful to see so many people. And um, I want to especially thank uh, Jason and Yegi for being here. It's really, really a pleasure, an honor, a privilege to, to have you here. Um, so uh, can you hear me OK in the back? Um, so I actually didn't realize until very, 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 very recently Jason's original connection with the Book Passage Travel Writers and Photographers Conference. Um, and I was delighted to find out about it. But can you talk a little bit more since we are here? Sure. Once upon a time, yeah. you were actually a participant sitting in those chairs looking up here at the stage. That's true. Um, I've been coming to Book Passage since I was in high school. This was my bookshop. Uh, I grew up in San Rafael, and um, from a, a pretty early age, I spent a lot of time there. I think most of you who are similarly aged, uh, between maybe uh, 20 and 60, <laughs> <laughs> if you're local, you oh, got your it. first driver's license, uh, like I did right here. Uh, and this is kind of, and, and went and stood in line to watch Star Wars movies, <laughs> right over there. And so this little stretch of road has been an integral part of my life uh, since I was a little kid. Uh, I, I came to the, the travel writing conference for the first time right after I graduated from college uh, in the year 2000. And I knew that I wanted to, to write professionally, uh, but I wasn't sure how you go about doing that. And I had had the fortunate opportunity to travel to, to many uh, countries at a young age and, and knew that I wanted to do more of that. So this was a wonderful experience for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I learned so much from uh, some people who are still on faculty, including <laughs> Don and Linda. Um, I, I, Linda and I have taken several, I've taken several classes from Linda over the years, and it's really exciting to be back here. Um, and in that first conference, I, um, I, there, is there still a writing contest? Oh, yeah, much so. yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I hope all of you uh, who are participating have, have submitted uh, essays for, for the contest. 
I'll tell you that I took honorable mention. Uh, so <laughs> I'm looking to see who is going to be the honorable mention. <laughs> I, um, I assume big thanks for that. <laughs> Great. So that was two two thousand, and that came back again in two thousand one, and then once again uh, a couple of years later. And I want to say that that two years ago, um, in July of two thousand seventeen, um, I came to town and I reached out to Elaine. Uh, I hadn't been in touch with her in many years, and I told her uh, we sat in the coffee shop over there uh, and talked about the book that I was writing. Um, and she was um, as enthusiastic and supportive as she is with all writers. Uh, and she said, you're going to come back and you're going to come to the conference uh, when the book comes out. And so here we are. And you could, uh, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a yeah. if you're a working writer or an aspiring writer, uh, you could have no better friend than Elaine and Book Passage. So it's a really special place. It, 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 it feels very full circle. We've been going around the country for the past six months talking about our experience and this book, but um, coming back home is uh, very gratifying. Welcome home. Thank you. It's great to have you back. <laughs> um, well, that's pretty inspiring, I think, for a lot of people who are here uh, at the conference for the first time or the third time or the twelfth time, um, what you've done with your career post-book passage. Can you um, just briefly outline for people kind of the trajectory, your professional trajectory, so sure. we have a sense of that? Yeah, so I was, um, from that first conference, until 2009, uh, trying to figure out how do you begin a career in writing, especially uh, if you haven't got uh, a real clear path into it. You know, a lot of people study journalism and they get an internship their senior year in college at a newsroom, and then the next year they're hired on at that newsroom or a different newsroom. I hadn't done any of that stuff. Uh, so I had to kind of figure it out. And um, during that time, I fell in love with Iran. I started traveling there in 2001. And um, every year, I'd make a couple of trips. My father came from Iran. Um, my mother was from the Midwest. They chose to raise my big brother and me right here in Marin County, which was about as far away psychologically and ideologically <laughs> in those two places. But there was a draw. Uh, and I, I knew that if I could go to Iran and write about Iran, it would be um, a rich opportunity and one that would never uh, bore me, yeah. to be honest. Uh, and it, it wasn't easy. You know, I had pieces published in different publications over the years. Uh, but to to augment my my travels, I worked in my dad's uh, Persian rug shop. And those of you who are local, have been here for a long time, know the building that he built in Tam Junction. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have a few so, here. But don't ask me about anything that's happened in that shop post 1986 because that was the last time we were there. Uh, you know. I ended up working with my dad in Petaluma, where he had a store for a long time. Uh, and then I opened up a, a shop uh, myself in San Francisco, right off of Union Square, in, uh, in the spring of 2008, which was not exactly <laughs> the And I, you know, before the, the crisis hit, I remember the first day I was open, I had big banners in the window, grand opening sale and all of this. And uh, a middle-aged couple walked by, and the door was open. It was an unusually hot day in May in San Francisco. And the husband said to his wife, this place has been closing since the day it opened. Today is the day Uh, it was rough from the start. <laughs> uh, and by October of 
October of 2009, um, you know, five months into this endeavor, I realized that this was not going to be an era to sell mm. Persian rugs. It was probably an era to sell Persian stories. <laughs> and uh, I closed the, the doors of my shop um, in May of 2009, bought a one-way ticket to Tehran, which to a lot of people seems pretty rash. Uh, but um, that was right before the, the big election in 2009 and ultimately the Green Movement and the protests that followed. And until the day I was arrested, I was never out of work. Mm. And that's, uh, I don't want to spoil the ending for aspiring writers, but that's a pretty rare thing. <laughs> uh, so if you can find a, an opportunity that's, uh, or a gig that's so consistent, that everybody in the world uh, wants to publish what you have to, to say about the place. Um, you're on to something. <laughs> when you went there, were you thinking, I'm going to become a journalist? I knew, I mean, I knew that this is what I was going to do. I had published um, some articles over the years in the Chronicle, actually. And um, I was filing stories about that election for the Chronicle and uh, for Slate. From here or after you got there? After I got there. Um, and the, the day before that election, um, I wrote a piece that, that ended up getting picked up um, by the New York Times. And that was really kind of mm. the beginning. Mm. And what happened after? that? What kind of was the next phase? Well, I mean, I ended up, I mean, the very next phase was that election happened and journalists were kicked out of Iran, and I was told to, to leave as well, and I left for uh, a period of time, and that's when I met Yeti. Uh, we happened to both be in Dubai for, uh, you know, a short period of time and had a chance encounter, and that was 10 years ago last month. Wow. Uh, so, Ten years ago last month. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I came back to Iran, and from 2000, the end of 2009 until 2014, and up until now, I, I was the only uh, U.S. citizen working as a correspondent in Iran on a permanent basis. Um, I ended up getting hired by the, the Washington Post in 2012, and, um, and still work for the Right. Um, great. I have more questions about that. But Yegi, I want to ask you what you thought about this young man when you first met him. She didn't How, think I was that young. How, <laughs> How did that happen, and what were your what was going on in your head? Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and thanks to Elaine and Book Passage for hosting us. Thank you for spending your Saturday night with us. Mm -hmm. um, well, what did I think? Um, Jason likes to say that it was love at first sight on his side. <laughs> I think it was love at first sight for both of us. Uh. As I told earlier in the session I had with Jeff since I was nine years old, I always knew that I'm going to marry an American. Wow. So I had no idea because I was always fascinated with the culture and I always wanted to travel and see this amazing country, and meet the people, and get their real stories. I'm separate from everything that the, the Islamic Republic regime fed me and the people from my generation who were born after the 79 revolution. So I remember when I was probably nine years old, I told my mom that I would like to marry an American, and she said, yeah, I was dreaming marrying a Japanese guy. <laughs> Guessing at all, and you and, would, yes. I'm sorry for no, interrupting you. I remember. I mean, 
if you grew up in a, one of those third world countries, you either want the parents constantly tell you that you're either going to be a doctor or you have to marry a doctor. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember from the very early on, I told him that I love the fact that he's a writer. That uh, was very important. Uh, I was fascinated by the fact that he was not just thinking about being a journalist mm. or do his journalism work in a perfect way. I love it that he was a writer. And mm. I always knew he was going to write a book. I just didn't know the book would be about that. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> wasn't in the script. <laughs> and did you want to be a writer at that point too? Interestingly, I got a master's degree in English literature, so I was also in very fascinated with literature, um, both both Persian and, and English. Um, and I remember at the time when I was probably 20, 21, I had a professor who was telling me about this amazing course in the U.S. universities called Creative Writing. And I was like, oh, wow, what's that? <laughs> and then I met a guy who had a degree in Creative wow. Writing. So it was amazing. That may be the only time in history a degree in Creative Writing. <laughs> from Marin, probably? Very much, how did, at least back then. How did, yeah, how did that work out? How were you able to develop your relationship? I think Jason is more equipped to, to answer this question because I think it, it is more interesting from his point of view. Because I was, I grew up in, I was born in Tehran, I was raised in Tehran, lived my entire life in Tehran until I left in 2016. So the limitations that are both culturally and politically and traditionally are imposed on people from my generation who were born after the revolution seems relatively normal to me, but I'm sure it was not, they were not okay with the guy. <laughs> I mean, not okay? I mean, it turned out to be okay, but, um, I mean, you know, there's no living together before marriage. No, I <laughs> just <laughs> there. Um, no, I mean, we found ways to spend time together. We spent a lot of time on the phone. Uh, it, it's kind of like dating in the eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a really sweet courtship we spent. Um, and he showed me a lot of Tehran. We went to museums together and, and parks. And it wasn't like we were taking um, trips around the country together because you can't do that. Um, and it, you know, it's, it, it's incremental, right? It, 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 I met her sister, um, and then. Months later, I met her mom. And a couple of years after that, I met her dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was challenging, but it was also, you know, I, I was part of a very small community of other dual nations, right? Um, and we were all navigating the same situation. Um, so it was unique and different. And everything about it, um, you know, Alcohol, for example, is you know illegal in Iran, which makes it again like drinking in high school. <laughs> we don't do that here, right? But uh, but you know you, you get a thrill out of having a beer when you're 33 years old. <laughs> this is for beer. Yeah. As Jason says, Iran is a very fascinating place, and it never disappoints. Absolutely. So I, wa I wanted to ask you, you both, because 
Iran is absolutely such a fundamental part of your lives. What is it, well, first of all, I want to ask you, what did you fall in love with in Iran at first? What made you kind of love with Iran? So many different aspects of it, but I think that to pinpoint it, it was the, the place that I visited that was completely itself, mm -hmm. right? You know, you can go to anywhere in Europe and feel like you could be, there's a corner of every city in Europe that makes you feel like you could be in San Francisco or New York or London or wherever. When you're in Iran, you're in Iran. Um, and what does that mean when you say that? What, like, what's well, an image? I mean, it, so, you know, you walk down the street and, you know, you wonder where the McDonald's or the Starbucks is, and it's not there. Right? Uh, and so that's kind of cool. Uh, but also, there is a, a self-contained element of it where, you know, you're in a city like Tehran that has 14 million people. It's very frenetic and chaotic and lots of traffic. But everybody there feels as though they can have a conversation with everybody else. Hmm. You know, you get into these taxi cabs that are uh, shared taxi cabs. It's like the Uber pool uh, <laughs> before that was a thing. So you, know, you get in a car, and there's a driver, and you don't know anybody else who's in there with you. And it's a very intimate experience. There are tiny little cars, and there's three people in the back. And there's one guy driving and one guy riding shotgun. And industrious drivers put one person in the middle between him and the passenger. <laughs> and he might be straddling a stick shift because all the cars are so oh! and they get to know people in that sort of environment. And um, I, I think sort of the barriers to, to basic human contact are lower, but um, but deeper human relationships don't come easy. And so it's a challenging place to figure out, and one that um, I, I never once got bored while I was there. Mm. And you were always kind of trying to figure it out. You're still trying to, still figure, trying it to figure it out. out. And you probably feel the same way about Japan, right? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And so it's like that's, it's that kind of, of, of um, curiosity that, that fueled my experience. Yeah, endlessly intriguing. Always. Yeah. Yegi, what do you love about Iran? What don't I love? <laughs> it's, it's my home. It's my, um, yes, I love America and I'm extremely <coughs> appreciative about America adopting me. Mm -hmm. um, We're so happy to have you. Thank you. In fact, I'm Actually, a, this is. I'm a new citizen. I'm a new American. Oh. We are the richer for it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Um, but that's my home. That's my identity. That's where I grew up. That's everything I know. Um, that's where all of my memories um, have, have formed. Um, all of my best friends, my parents, the love, live there. Um, I have siblings there. So it's everything. And then after all, um, for nothing but two things, for because of my job as a journalist, and above that, for marrying a guy who is only half foreign, I have been abundant from, I have been banned from my country. So that's extremely painful. I, I now have that love and hate relationship with it, that I love everything about it, but I hate the idea of probably it's something different from Hades, a little sense of um, fear that I love it so much, but I, I'm scared about think, even thinking about going back because um, I feel like not the people, but somehow I have been betrayed. Yeah. Um, they took my husband hostage, they made me feel miserable. And um, um, I still have many, many fond memories of many, many good people. There were taxi drivers who took me around um, for more than a year um, when Jason 
was in prison and they never charged me. Wow. Oh, yeah. Just because these guys have such great hearts. And wow. as Jason said, the, the human relationship is so deep. And every time I remember I told that guy that, please, this is not acceptable, you have to charge. He said, I will never charge a woman who does not have her um, husband with her or the protection of her husband. Um, any day that he's out, you can ask him to, to come and pay me. <laughs> which, which didn't happen. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, I didn't have a chance to go back to it. Um, but I have also, unfortunately, through our experience, met people that um, consistently um, question my love, <coughs> my love for my husband. I've met people that ask me, why did you marry this guy? What's special about this foreign guy? There was something wrong with a man like me. Why didn't you marry your cousin? Uh, why you marry your cousin? Um, um, so I feel I have a little bit of, I feel a little bit disgusted about thinking yeah. about those, yeah. those folks. Right. So it sounds to me like you hold two Irans in your heart. Kind of. True. Yeah. If I, as a visitor, were to go to Iran and were to experience the Iran that you love, what, what would I experience, do you think? Well, you will arrive, and um, I think the best example is what, what Tony said about Anthony Bourdain. Um, said about his time in Iran that it's a fascinating place. It's not east, it's not west, it's something in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and people are extremely warm and welcoming and hospitable. Okay. And they especially love Americans. And as soon as, if you're a little bit blonde or you have blue eyes, they definitely, they don't think about you as a German or European or France, French or anything. They immediately think of you as American and they would love to invite you to their homes and cook for you. Um, it's, it's a historic place. There are many, many places you can go and visit all around the country. People are nice. Um, I can't promise about what the government <laughs> think or would do. I hope all people can go one day. There is a day that everyone can go freely and just experience the, the, the beautiful land and amazing people who have been taken hostage for a long time. We all hope that. What was your experience as a, as a visitor, even, I mean, a working visitor, mm -hmm. but still as a, as a visitor, what was your experience of, of Iran? Did you, <coughs> Are, are Yankees' words resonating for you? hundred percent. And I think uh, it's one of these places that um, the, the deeper you get into it, uh, the harder you fall for it, mm -hmm. but the more complicated things become. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working in Iran has also, especially if you're a foreigner, but for anybody, has a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. The bureaucracy of, of working there, or just getting there. I mean, some of you, I'm sure, have tried to travel there and get a visa. It's pretty complicated. Um, but once you're in, you're there, right? You, it's, and it's like a, a wonderland of possibilities and experiences. Um, and I felt, I think it might have changed a bit since um, since we left. Uh, it's been five years since I was free in Iran. Uh, but that um, doors were open to you as a as a a, a foreign person living there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Lots of people wanted to, to to bring you into their lives, and you know that's certainly so for for travelers who visit for short periods of time. But for those of us who are there for extended periods, the the, the range of opportunities to connect with people, and for somebody who's working as a journalist, you know that's incredible. Right? I mean, I I wrote about so many different types of people um, while I lived there, from pretty high level. Um, Officials, business people, athletes, artists, 
but also people, you know, struggling in poverty. Uh, I did a big piece about um, women who were recovering drug addicts, and that's the sort of thing that average Iranian or you know, you know, Iranian journalist would have a tough time covering because they would, those people would not feel as comfortable letting somebody from their own society into their difficult world. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt I had a lot of um, privilege, and with that privilege came this responsibility to not break eggs. Right. right. Um, there's a couple of quotes from your book that I, I want to read. First of all, I just want to say, <coughs> excuse me, if you don't own this book, you should own this book. Multiple copies. Multiple copies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a really, really extraordinary read. I read it, I think, in one sitting, basically. It's just an amazingly compelling story, beautifully told, and uh, it belongs in every house. Um, there's a couple of quotes that really struck me that I would like you to just talk about a little bit. One is, you said, and, and uh, you'll give the backstory. Maybe everybody already knows the backstory, but after I say this quote, you can sort of fill in the backstory. You said, trading for rugs and hostages is pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mentioned that I was in the, in the rug business, uh, and, you know, clearly from my story, I consider myself part of this long history of... Um, of U.S. nationals taken <coughs> hostage by the Islamic Republic, and you know most of you remember um, our first brush with the Islamic Republic in 1979, mm -hmm. and um, the long ordeal that uh, was very much part of the public consciousness on a nightly basis. People forget that Nightline, the television yeah. show, was spawned from yeah. from this. Thing that became a, a national crisis. Um, another thing that people don't think about was the impact that that period had on Iranians living in this country. Uh, my, my dad immigrated to the United States in 1959, well before the revolution, had no political aspirations. Uh, he was a businessman. Got a green card in the late 60s, and by the mid 70s, he was an American citizen. But um, from the moment that the hostages were taken, he and every other small uh, business owner who happened to be from Iran originally uh, became the subject of, of intense scrutiny, attacks, harassment. Um, and that was even so here in. Marin County. I mean, the shop is four miles up the road, down the road. Um, and so he was he was deeply affected by that experience of having his livelihood cut off because of where he came from. And he always, after that experience, um, when asked, you know, where he was from, because my dad, uh, some of you might have known him, uh, met him spoke English very well, but with a very thick accent. Um, he was more of a numbers guy than a literature guy. Um, and people would ask him where you're from, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm Iranian by birth, and I'm American by choice, and I'm proud of both. Um, and so when the hostages were released, finally, in January of um, 1981, many businesses around the country, different communities, had this outpouring of love and support uh, for the returning hostages that manifested itself in gifts. So, you know, Omaha, Nebraska sent them years' supplies of steaks if they wanted them. Uh, Hawaii's tourism board invited them all for uh, an all expense paid vacation. Uh, Major League Baseball gave each one of the former hostages two golden tickets that they could use at every major league stadium during the regular season for the rest of their lives. Oh, wow. And I know some of those former hostages and they're still using those. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and one of the gifts was, was from my dad, who mm. um, 
who extended an offer of a Persian rug from his shop uh, to the returning hostages. And of the 52, 40-something uh, took them up on it. And some of them came here to Malawi. Some of them sent people in their place. Some of them called and said, will you send me something like this? And, uh, and, and one of those former hostages has, he and his Iranian wife, actually, uh, have become good friends of Yegi and I. Uh, they live in, uh, in Northern Virginia, right outside of D.C. And uh, we've gone to visit him. And every time we go to the house, it's a, it's a rug about this size. <laughs> and he kicks over the corner and the label for my dad's shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's great. So in your case, what's the trading for rugs? How does that apply to, to your well, situation? Well, I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, when you're taken by the Iranian regime, I, I do these conversations a lot, and people ask me, yeah, 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 but, but why did they, why did they take you? Why, you know, if, if you're not a spy or if you weren't doing anything, what, what, what were they thinking that you were doing? They didn't think I was doing anything. They just thought I was an American who would have value in a negotiation with the United States. <laughs> and so it, it really became uh, front and center in my mind after a few months that uh, my ordeal here is only going to come to an end when the United States government decides to step in and give these people whatever they want. And um, I read a lot about hostages in Iran and in other places because unfortunately uh, more, more and more governments are doing this. Uh, and it's a multi-pronged problem. Um, We have to figure out how to uh, compel governments not to take hostages, first of all. Mm -hmm. But more importantly for me personally, is figuring out how to bring those people who are being held hostage, especially in Iran, but in other countries as well, home. Because if our, uh, our safety as American citizens, uh, wherever we are in the world, is not a priority for our government, then something's very um, so it's, it's multi-pronged. We have to figure out how to solve the problem. But for me, the thing that keeps me up at night is, what can I do today to help those guys that are still there come back? And what I've figured out is that they're not coming back until it's politically uh, important enough for whatever American administration's in office. So I press that button every chance I get. Yeah, yeah. and we all should. Yeah, everybody should. Yeah. The other, thank you. And the other quote was, I was now a living centerpiece in a struggle that I had spent years through my explanatory writings seeking to diffuse. It's one of the great sadnesses of my life that uh, I spent years covering this place in, um, I don't want to say in neutral tones, because that's not true. but trying to explain the place in you know its beauty and ugliness and everything in between uh, with the intent of informing American readers. Right? I went there knowing that I knew something about the place, its culture, its people, and uh, the reports that I could send from, from there would have value. And when we were taken, it was at the height of negotiations between Iran, the U.S., and other world powers over uh, Iran's nuclear program. And the fact that I got caught up in the middle of that and became you know, a storyline in the story that I've been covering, it's not anything that any journalist ever hopes to happen. Uh, and then when it does, you know, it's very rare that that journalist has the opportunity to um, <coughs> To write about it ever again, because unfortunately most people don't come home. If you become part of the story, more than likely it means you didn't come back. Um, and so I came back and decided that I was going to finish that story and um, and report the heck out of it, and hoped that the product um, would resonate and would explain something that um, that still hadn't been explained. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
And I want to ask you both because it raises I mean, I, your your life story, the story of the imprisonment, is so emotionally charged that I, I want to talk about that. But first, I want to ask a just a, a craft question, actually, because there's a we're all sort of learning writers sure. here. You both, from different perspectives, are trying to explain, or we're trying to explain, are trying to explain Iran to people who aren't necessarily familiar with it. Yegi, I'm going to ask you first. How do you, what are some of the practices that you put into place, or how are you thinking about a story to do that as effectively as possible? Wow, that's such an interesting question. Um, First of all, I always try to make sure that my audience, whoever they are, um, I, I do a good job of differentiating between the government and the people of Iran. Because <coughs> Iranian people are very ordinary people that you can meet anywhere with the same hopes and dreams and aspirations. They don't want anything except good life for themselves and children. And uh, I really believe 85%, 90% of the population is really done with this regime. So they just want to break that shell and come out free. Um, so, but also, um, I write about Iran these days less. Uh, when I was in Iran and reporting for a foreign audience back then, um, as Jason taught me to do was um, I didn't need to necessarily write super hard news political stories mm -hmm. because I think Western people, especially Americans, have read a lot of those stories but that does not necessarily make you learn about that society. Um, we, we read every day in the news that President Trump said this, so the President Rouhani from Iran said this. It's like a constant football, mm -hmm. as Americans say, soccer, <laughs> that they are playing <laughs> against each other. Um, instead, just tell the stories of ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Think that wherever you are from, whatever walks of life you come from, you can relate to someone else in different part of the world. Um, family stories. Um, I should not spoil Jason's answer, but I love that that his last byline from Tehran was the story he wrote about Iran's national baseball team. Mm -hmm. I doubt many Americans even knew that Iran has a national baseball team that in fact is not in like a really lower level among the international baseball league, it's doing better than Iran's soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when, when his story came out, within 24 hours, um, the response he got on social media and the number of emails that Americans sent to him saying, um, what can we do for this team? Um, how can we send supplies to this for this team? Um, these are the stories that people can easily relate to. If you read that story on the surface, is it was the story of ordinary people, but basically the politics was within the lines. You could eventually get to that. All of this is happening because of this. Uh, the major reason is this. So you don't necessarily need to tell super political stories. Just make it relatable to, to the people. Um, I think the reason that many, many people, no, no matter where they come from or what, they, what age they are, really loved Anthony Bourdain's show and they all watched it and they got to travel with him because he wouldn't go necessarily into a place and tell a political story. Mm -hmm. He was getting out to a new country, talking to everybody over a meal so that we can all um, relate to food. Whatever, um, one of our friends were saying that at the time that the election, 2016 election happened, one side of his family were 
Hillary Clinton fans and one side were <laughs> Donald Trump fan and mm -hmm. they were always fighting but when it came to sharing a meal together at dinner they all got along and they <laughs> were even able to exchange their political views mm -hmm. in a nice civilized friendly way mm -hmm. so I think just tell the stories of who we are we're all human beings Great answer. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it was always for me really important, to, like Amy said, to, to tell stories of real people because I realized that if I wanted to do it the way that everybody else did it, I wouldn't last very long. Uh, and that's not why I got into it. And there's always going to be an AP and a Reuters and an AFP that are going to tell you the story of the latest, you know, missile test or you know what the Friday prayer leader said at Friday prayers or you know what the spring leader said that's all going to be there I'm here on the ground the value that I can add is to tell you what it's really like and so you know I try to put myself in the shoes of Iranians on a daily basis and write about how US policy and their own governments and policies affected the lives of people so I wrote a lot about sanctions and the baseball story was basically a sanction story. These guys love baseball, they want to play baseball. They don't have access to, to balls. They have to make their own mitts and bats, you know, and they love it that much. And you know, I knew that Americans would read that. So this is one of these things where it's I made the connection between an unexpected phenomenon in a faraway place that resonated so much with readers that like Yankee yeah, said, people were writing to me saying how can we ship them a supply of, of balls and cleats and all of this? Two days later, I was arrested. I had nothing to do with that article. But you haven't read another article like that um, in the five years and one month since I was arrested because there hasn't been an American based on the ground. I read a lot of articles about what the leader said or what Trump or John Bolton and Mike Pompeo say about Iran. I read that every day. Uh, but you don't have that that granular feel because uh, frankly, Yegi and I were 40% of the English language news media in Iran at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I have not been replaced. Have not been replaced. Right. Wow, that that is the most perfect metaphor to my mind for what great travel writing does too, because it creates those bridges between cultures. Exactly. People who have this indivisible or this this gap between them that you think you can't ever bridge, you write a story like that and suddenly there's this incredible bridge that you've just built, a human bridge where people feel this connection and the great the great other becomes this very friendly, warm, I get it, they love baseball, I love baseball. And I mean, we're here at a travel writers conference, that's a great travel writer, builds those bridges, absolutely. I, I was incredibly inspired and moved to hear that. Um, I hate, I, I'm looking at the clock and I don't want it to move anymore. So I have a lot of questions. So I'll try to. Um, um, this wonderful, amazing, extraordinary, moving, compelling account 544 days in an Iranian prison. Um, I guess the one question I want to ask you is what was the hardest part of writing this book? I'm trying to think what the easiest part was. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think so. The hardest part, and I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to ruin the ending, but the second to last chapter, which is um, the chapter that is about our ultimate release and um, everything that went into that happening and almost not happening, mm -hmm. uh, and it was. Uh, I've been. You know, working on, on a book continuously for about a year and a half, and I had a deadline um, in, at the end of May of last year to deliver my manuscript, and I still hadn't written this chapter. I had about five days to go. <coughs> I knew exactly what I wanted to say. Everything else was done. Um, I had written the last chapter of the book before I'd written anything else. Wow. Um, and uh, you know, we talked yesterday a bit about structure, you know, write a book the way 
it works for you. For me, it was, you know, write all the component parts and then, you know, take pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and put it together. Um, but that last, that last part was so hard because uh, there was so much anger, uh, fear. It was the closing of a chapter in both of our lives. Um, and it, I mean, you know, it had a, a visceral effect on me to write this. So I'm glad that it only took me a few days to get it done. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, people ask me all the time if it was cathartic to write this book. No, it's cathartic <laughs> to have it done. <laughs> I don't have to be talking about it now. But the, but the process of writing this, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to wake up this morning, I'm going to feel so great, it's going to be like yoga. You know? <laughs> it was not like that. You probably drenched up all the bad memories, huh? Of course, lots of bad memories. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is a question for both of you. What was the biggest lesson that you took away from captivity? So, you know, I, I took that with me through the experience. Okay. Yesterday was really hard. Hopefully today will be a little bit easier. Um, and maybe tomorrow I won't be here. Uh, and you just have to keep telling yourself that until you're a book passage three and a half years later. <laughs> <laughs> it may sound like it, but it's not like a cliche answer, but. Um, I think survival and then trust. If you survive many, many days of prison, especially solitary confinement, then you know you can survive anything else. Mm -hmm. um, because I describe solitary confinement as a as a grave that they put you in while you're still alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of your senses, you can hear, you can um, see but there's nothing to be seen. You're deep underground that no one can hear you, no one can see you. Um, and then trust, because I'm sure many of you have experienced this by, by different virtue, but we know our loved ones and our friends and even our enemies better when we are going through hardships. Because when life is beautiful and everything is great, everybody's around. And it's at those very difficult moments that you know your real friends. Your if you, you can trust your loved ones if they're still there for you, if they're willing to go through this with you. So I'm now very selective when it comes to who's my friend, who I should trust, who I can't trust, and who I shut down right away. Um, 
out of my life because um, of everything that I have experienced. Um, so yeah, and unfortunately, uh, there were several couples that were going through a similar experience. Um, at least one other American who was in prison at the time, with Jason in a separate location. Um, he had a wife and children. And um, I remember at the time, his wife was fighting so very hard for his release. And then after he got out, eventually, um, their marriage did not last. Because it, it is such a heavy experience. Um, and despite the fact that you are fighting for that person, the experience somehow changes you for better or worse. So the fact that we trusted each other throughout the whole experience and we still trust each other for no matter what happens, so the fact that we never surprise each other because we just want to know. No what, surprises. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> um, also, because we, we can't hide anything from each other, even for happy reasons. Um, so, yeah, trust and so on. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly moving <laughs> answer. I feel like we've just been given access to a little sacred moment here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so what's been the biggest lesson since you've been free? Life is filled with lessons when you're free. <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta keep your eyes open, your ears open. Experience things. I, you know, I, I think um, in those first days and weeks of freedom, I was sort of curious why I wasn't happier. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I mean, we all know this on a kind of molecular level, but you know, happiness doesn't really come from your surroundings. You know, it comes from other other sources, um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I've learned to, to be very patient with both of us, mm -hmm. and less patient with some other people, mm -hmm. right, uh, to Yegi's point about knowing who to trust mm -hmm. and, and who not to trust. Um, and I think that also we, we, you know, on a very different level, I mean, we came out in 2016, at the beginning of 2016, very during a very different political moment than the one that we're living in right now, um, and it was a very warm reception, uh, and we continue to have a warm reception in some parts of the country, um, but it was an eye opener just to see how quickly, and I guess part of that is because we live in Washington, D.C. now, mm -hmm. but to see how quickly the tables mm -hmm. turn, uh, and it's just a reminder to me, to us, to just keep being who we are, and not, you know, the Iranians have a term, you know, the party of the wind, the people who, mm -hmm. who you know, will blow a different direction uh, when the political tides change, and we haven't done that, we're just who we are. Um, take us away. We'll take you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, what was the question? <laughs> What's been the biggest lesson since you've been free? Um, I think just as Jason said, stay true to yourself. If you work where you are, I mean, you should not change because um, the political scene changed. Also, I think when you experience, as I go back to, if you experience prison, especially solitary confinement, um, after that when you freely, first of all when you have the free will of choice, so you deeply appreciate that. Also everything, look at the blue sky, you're like, I'm not a religious person at all, but you think to yourself, Thanks 
to whatever, for some people it's God, for some people it's an energy, but that I have this opportunity to look at the blue sky this morning, or have a bite of an apple. I remember at the time in prison, I really somehow craved apple, um, or when you take a warm shower, um, just water running on your face. The fact that you were still alive, it um, could have ended thousand other different sadder, darker way. Um, so the gift of coming back to life and have freedom. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm going to open a goat bed. I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Um, there's been a lot. There's been a lot written about the danger that journalists um, have when they're overseas, and perhaps now even in our own country. But uh, some of us who aren't as knowledgeable are, are very concerned about how can journalists be protected. I mean, I'm sure you've thought about it. Um, who are with the Post or the Times, and, and they're you know in, in dangerous places. Um, is there anything that any of us could do or, you know, ways to somehow ensure that you are free? I mean, historically, journalists were, were not arrested and, and they would be free to, they might be asked to leave, but they, they weren't in danger like you were. Right, so the question is, how can journalists be protected? What can we do? That's your fault. <laughs> we have a session about this earlier today. So right now I work for the Committee to Protect Journalists. And what we do is to document every attack, every assault, every threat that um, is imposed on journalists everywhere, globally, and also here at home. And um, I think journalists, whoever they are, whatever they're right about, whatever their views are, should be free to report and bring us information because what would be we be without not having information about other places, even other corner of this huge country. Imagine if you never hear about whatever that happens in DC or New York, or if there's a flood, things like this. Um, it starts from every, every single one of us. I would say by, as I said earlier, by support your local journalists. And then when it gets to the bigger scene, Keep people in power accountable. Mm -hmm. Don't let this anti-press rhetoric get any bigger than what already is, especially here in this country. Because as I said, um, America used to be this great beacon of hope, carrying the torch in, in support of freedom of the press and um, human rights abuses everywhere. And people everywhere else look up to America for, for having that leadership role that unfortunately is now missing. Um, I find Americans a very, very forgiving nation. Um, but I hope American people become more politically active, yeah. vote. Don't think because you live in California you should not vote, or your vote doesn't count. If there is any way that you can get involved in your local politics, I would really hope to see the day now as an American we get rid of this electoral college system. Right. Because there are countries who impose cash fine on their people for not showing up to the polling stations. They turn their election on, on a weekend, or they declare it as a national holiday so more people can go and vote. I feel like here there is a systematic push to stop people, to prevent people from going to vote. So make sure you keep your people in power accountable so America goes back to its re re leadership role. And I told earlier, Maybe I should re repeat that number. Since President Trump announced his candidacy for a presidential race, 
he sent out 1,300 tweets out, oh, attacking journalists mm -hmm. and media, whether uh, media as a whole or singling out journalists. In half of those tweets, he used the term fake news. Mm -hmm. Since then, the number of journalists who have been arrested globally under the term fake news mm -hmm. have been tripled. Oh, no. No. Turkey never used the, the term fake news before. Now they arrest people, the journalists, and the guy did not make any crime. I mean, he did not do anything wrong. He's just a journalist. But it's so easy that they think he committed fake news mm. crime. What is that? I mean, it's not defined anywhere. So it starts from here. One thing I would add is uh, subscribe to a local newspaper, yeah, and a national one if you don't already. But you know, support support independent uh, news. Yes. Hi. <laughs> so, for those of us who were here and, and were following what was going on on social media and whatnot, do you think it it actually helps for people to sign those petitions and to share this information, I guess probably the bigger question is what can we do? I understand the political piece of it, but just on a day-to-day -day basis for people who are wrongfully accused and imprisoned, what else could we do a world away? So on a day-to-day -day basis, what can we do to help free people who have been wrongfully imprisoned? I was under the impression and hope very early on that people would be very loud uh, and stand in solidarity with me, talk about me as a person, as an individual, things that I have done, things that I had been involved with, because um, I think that, that transparency is sort of poison to these kinds of cases. And ultimately, um, when, uh, when you find yourself in one of these predicaments like we did, you also, I mean, I, I was put on trial in the Revolutionary Court. And if you ever find yourself on trial that's got revolutionary in its name, <laughs> you're not going to win. <laughs> and I mean, that's just a fact. Uh, when we were released, we were on, on, the, on the flight out. There were two other, you mentioned one of them, there was another gentleman who was a former Marine. Uh, with us that, that was released, and I said to him, I said, you know, what do you think the conviction rate at uh, the Revolutionary Court is? <laughs> High 90s? He said, no, Jason, it's got to be at least 110 <laughs> <laughs> percent. So, and so, you know, you, you just know that, that the, the battle that you're fighting is not the one in the court that you're actually appearing in physically. It's the battle that's taking place in the court of public opinion that I believe helped galvanize our plight to such an important level at a time when negotiations between Iran and the U.S. were reaching a crescendo that, you know, the headline, uh, if you go back and look at the, the days following that deal, the day following that deal, you know, it's Americans released in, you know, week or deal. The headline would have been, Americans continue to languish in prison, and we just gave Iran all these concessions, right? So um, it's a strange thing to be in that situation where you're uh, wrapped up and equated in it. But as I said earlier, for me, the priority is how we can get this one guy out. I have that luxury because I'm not a politician. Right? I also have a platform, multiple platforms available to me to make that heard over and over and over again. You know, people ask me all the time, why do you keep writing about these hostages? <coughs> I write about these hostages because they're sponsors, right? If people didn't do that for me, we wouldn't be here today. Right. Another question? Okay, way in the back. <laughs> I didn't quite hear it. Thank you. 
does Amnesty International have a positive effect in cases like this? No. No. Unfortunately, no. I think they have a, a, a they help publicize it. But they don't have any political power in terms of, in, in a country like Iran, they don't even let Amnesty International officials or like a delegation from Amnesty International or UN to come in to observe elections, to meet with prisoners. No. I mean, something is better than nothing. It's better to have organizations like that, as, as Jason said, to raise awareness and, and bring publicity to those cases, but they don't have any political power. As a practical matter, is it easy or impossible or difficult for the two of you to communicate with people in Iran now? Not impossible, not easy, um, and something that I think we're always very aware of. I mean, I get people reaching out to me all the time. More often than not, I don't respond unless I know them. Um, and the people that I do communicate with, that I do know, that aren't relatives, um, you know, I try and find other ways to communicate with them than, you know, obvious ways. Because I just assume that they might be under surveillance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The two of you have such a beautiful rapport. Um, mm -hmm. Just the, the trust you're talking about is so obvious, and you guys are such a team. I'm just curious, in the writing of the book, Yegi, were you, like, was you, was there, I mean, I assume you guys talked about it, I'm just curious what your um, involvement in it was, if you wanted to be near it, if you wanted to be away from it. So the question is, for Yegi, what role, given this fantastic, beautiful rapport that you two yeah. have, what role did you play in the writing of the book? Um, I think there were moments that I was really close to the... First of all, I was really close to the entire process because Jason was writing major parts of it at home. Um, but then there were stories that... Um, I read the first draft before he shared with other people or I read them several times and there were parts of it that we talked about everything, not because of the book, but right away. Um, imagine as a couple, when we first got out of Iran, we spent many, many nights staying up just talking about every little thing that I knew about after I was released out from the outside world and little things that happened to him while he was still um, detained that I wasn't with him, so we talk. I think it's really fair and safe to say that we try to make sure there's nothing that we hide from each other, because many people, for example, come out of these experiences, and if one of them has been physically assaulted or is psychologically so disturbed, they never share with each other. We wanted to make sure there are not secret dark moments that we don't know about. Um, between the two of us, and um, I, think he's, yeah, I'm sorry, the rest of it. I think I was pretty close to the entire process. Incredibly close, and I mean, it was very important on a, on a kind of mechanical level to figure out timelines of events, what was going on in the outside world, things that were said to her by officials or my brother or my mom. I mean, just, you know, just figuring out the whole thing. Uh, but then also on a kind of a, you know, support level. Uh, I mean, writing the difficult parts of the book, uh, there were weeks on end that I was suffering from nightmares. Every time he had a nightmare, I knew those weeks he's writing about mm -hmm. the hardest part of the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, you know, it's not... Uh, not every spouse is going to put up with that. And I think it helped that. <laughs> I think it helped, it helped us in a weird way that Yegye had experienced exactly the same things that I had. I mean, you know, the, the beginning of this ordeal and the end of it, we were together. 
That's one more in the middle. And, you know, For example, we, we heard from other um, former ex cons <laughs> that um, the husband was arrested, he went through the, the arrest scene, and then he was in prison. But the wife never had those experiences, so the understanding is difficult. You can relate to those stories. If you have never been to a solitary confinement, then you don't know what your husband or your wife is talking about. If you have never been interrogated, you don't know what, um, what you were suffering from after that experience. Um, so the fact that we, I shared a, a little bit of those, like we were arrested together, and then they we were released um, we left Iran together. Um, and then I think also the fact that you know, towards the middle to the end of my time in prison after Yegi was out, she was able to come and see me for an hour every week. And just being able to have a grasp of the psychological situation that I was in and my being able to kind of see the struggles from her end of hopelessness and you know, helplessness of the situation, I think it made it a lot. Um, I don't want to say easier, but you know, it made it possible for us to be softer on each other. When we came out. I understand. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I think, given the time, I'm sorry, I'm, maybe you can ask later on, but I'm going to ask one more question. Sure. I saved one easy question for last. Um, um, so given both of your amazing journeys in life so far, I'm wondering now, and I'll ask Yigi to answer first, and then you, Jason, what do you, what do you feel the, the purpose of your life is? <laughs> 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 there are many, many things I would like to do, but for now I just want to focus, um, as I said, because of, of the, the fake that um, I suffered from, uh, because of my the nature of, of the job that I was doing and because of the fact that I was married for well, foreign time. I just want to make sure two things. Um, first, and I think we talked about this many, many times when he was in prison and we met behind one of those windows when you talk through mm -hmm. telephones, ex exactly the way you, you've seen in the movies. We promised each other to make sure we do whatever we can to the extent extent that we can to make sure it's it's really huge and impossible but we try to make sure um, no one else will go through what we have been through and if we hear from folks that are going through similar experiences we make sure that we give their as voiceless people at the moment we become their voice. That's why now I work for the committee to protect journalists, to make sure no other colleagues of mine everywhere in the world doesn't experience what we have experienced. And that's what Jason is doing about all hostages, especially those who are detained in the world. So for now, that's what I'm doing. We are hoping we can create a little baby. Um, <laughs> that's another plan. <laughs> But I also think that it's uh, part of our purpose to um, live our lives and enjoy them and do the things that we want to do, but do them in ways that um, enrich not only ourselves but other people as well. Um, so, you know, we, we try and be, um, you know, light imprint campers. Um, and and I just like to continue experiencing things and, and writing about them. I, mean, I think my purpose um, was to explain a place and a situation that most people don't have the opportunity to get close to, and I did. 
And now we're in a different place that uh, most people don't have the opportunity to get that close to. Mm -hmm. And so I continue to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that's something that I can continue to do throughout my career and my life because um, it's what keeps me engaged and interested and excited. Um, and I think that there's, there's value. Mm -hmm. I just want to say it's been such an <laughs> honor and privilege and inspiration to talk to you both. Thank you so much.